Chapter 19 Rebecca descended toward the fifth arrow gate of Halcyon. She had designed it, a great eye-shaped passage with wide ramps rising from either side. A progression of shallow steps led from the center. Each tray was wide enough to hold 50 dock workers abreast, each deep enough to allow three strides before the next rise. The gate had been a fine design, but now it was being destroyed. Halcyon guards swarmed it, and in their midst, Yamoth. The lord of Halcyon stood atop the limestone arch. His robes of state were flung out onto the wing. He watched workers haul steel cables through groaning pulleys. They struggled to hoist a brassy ray cannon atop the wall. This vast gun had cost the city a small fortune, and Yalmoth had installed nine at each of the five gates. The weapons had come from Glaceon's old sketchbooks, and Yalmoth boasted that one of these could sink airships miles away. He had assured the city that these guns would make the city secure in case of invasion, and had even offset the cost by shipping more such weapons at a considerable markup to the other loyal four city-states. A necessity! Rebecca Grouse, as she strode up the spiral inner stair to the peak of the gateway. Nothing ugly is a necessity. It was one of her many credos bellied by the last few years. Rebecca reached the top of the arch. Yamal stood close by. He smiled to see her, not her, but the ray cannon that settled onto the limestone wall before her. As the cables eased, Yamal knelt beside the gleaming casing, running his fingers tenderly across it. Beautiful, he whispered excitedly. I can't imagine anything more beautiful. How about a gate that isn't bristling with guns? Rebecca asked. Yalmoth looked up at her, dark amid the halo of her distant temple. Hello, Rebecca. I can imagine one thing more beautiful than these. What's next? Catapults on the council dome? Flamethrowers on the temple? He continued buffing the gun, his face reflected in distorted angles from its casing. If you had designed these sites for defense as well as beauty, retrofits would not be necessary. Nothing ugly is necessary. Yalmoth stood, his features grave. He towered over the gun, the architect, over the whole lower city. You were wrong about that, Rebecca. Ugliness is necessary. We Thran were drawn upward by visions of beauty. We were impelled from below by ugliness, craven lust, violent depravity. These drove us up into the light. The empire was force in war, not peace. It rose from struggle, and another struggle is coming. An ugly, violent war that will drive us into divinity. Rebecca stared into his eyes. That act alone was an inertion of will. His powerful figure was the black incarnation of all of those animalistic forces he described. He was brutal and beautiful at once, apostate of all she once believed. Civil war! Burning ships! Fields of dead! Is it worth it? He blinked, withdrawing for a moment into interior spaces. I rose from lepers and plague victims to rule the empire. Glaceon descended from glories into decay. Peace brings thysis. Progression degeneration. War brings phyresis. Progressive generation. That is how we will rise, Rebecca. Impelled from below. Rebecca shook her head, turning away. Yalmoth wrapped a powerful arm around her. Your husband progresses well, I understand. Mention of Glaceon sent spiders of guilt creeping across Rebecca's scalp. She pulled away from him. It's quite a regiment you have him on. Skin grafts, needles and nerves, alcohol baths, leeches, plasters. Health through a struggle. We're approaching a final cure. Most of the patients are responding well. Even your husband, despite himself. He is in agony! Of course, without you. The air beside them shimmered with a sudden presence. The figure took form out of the clear sky. Dyfed suddenly stood there. Am I interrupting something? She asked, a smile quirking her lips. Yalmoth turned toward Dyfed, an avid look in her eyes. Have you found it? The woman's smile only deepened. Yes. Would you like to come see? Is it perfect? Yalmoth said excitedly. Nine separate spheres, each with its own ecology. Is it extensive? The land space is as large as your empire before the rebellion, and with work, it could be twice or thrice that. Is it beautiful? Dyfed crossed her arms over her chest and canted her hips. Do you want to come see it or not? What's this about? Interrupted Rebecca. Yalmo's eyes were feverish. You spoke of ugliness, but let me show you what it will all be for. He extended his hand to her. Rebecca wanted to refuse, but she could not. No sooner had her hand settled in his powerful grasp than Yalmoth turned and grasped Dyfed's hand. Take us there. Take us to paradise. Without so much as a twitch of her eyes, Dyfed whisked them away through the racing distances. Her touch on Yalmoth sent a glimmering envelope of power around him. It spread from his hand to Rebecca. Terror filled her hand. She could not move. She could not even gasp a breath. Across her skin, she felt the violent plucking of the space between worlds. It was as though locusts swarmed her, mandibles tearing at the mana membrane. Then, the chaos was gone. Dyfed stepped from the blinded turnies and into a wide, green, and beautiful world. The trio stood on a rocky outcrop. 
Below them lay a primeval forest, with tree trunks 20 feet wide and hundreds of feet tall. The tussled tops of ferns and cypress breathed easily in the blue winds of the place. A single broad channel broke the rooftops, a massive meandering river far below. Water moved, smooth and black, beneath the thick canopy, here and there reflecting scraps of sunlight on the fronds. Huge serpents coiled about the stout boughs. The streaks of strange birds filled the air. Beyond the forest spread a verdant grassland. It reached a long, low rumble of gray mountains in the distance. It's beautiful, Rebecca found herself gasping. Dyfe had watched her, grinning. More beautiful, bountiful and immense. Every Thran citizen, even the rebels and children, could be granted a thousand acres and still the Empire would own half the land. This is an uninhabited world. The smallest creature here has the brain the size of a chestnut. It is wide open for colonization. No war? No disease? Rebecca said. You have doubled the size of the Empire without a single death. Yamoth drew in a deep breath of fertile air. First of all, I will bring all those with the Thysis here, away from the power stones and their killing auras. He looked fondly at Rebecca and drew her toward him. I want you to design a new infirmary for the hillside there, above the river and beyond the forest eaves. I want you to design a facility that will allow for aggressive healing strategies, but also provide the patient sunlight, fresh air, beautiful views. She stared into his eyes as though into a sunrise. Oh, young moth, it would heal them. I know it would. Just to be out of that cave would heal them, to be far away from the power stones, and to be out beneath the sun. I want the infirmary to do more than heal them. I want it to perfect them, Rebecca. I want it to strengthen them, cure them of mortality. Doubt darkened Rebecca's eyes. You want them to do what? A quizzical look filled his face. You are the one who created the architect of ascension. You're the one who designed a temple that could be entered only by leaving the world. Yes, but all that is about aspiring to divinity, being modeled after beauty and perfection, being shaped by it, but not becoming it. Can we truly make ourselves gods? Dyfed laughed. It is easily done. She strode toward the other two, gripped their hands, and then stepped from the rocky ridge where they stood. The dimensions closed around them like a flower caught suddenly by nightfall. When it opened again, they stood in a very different place. Instead of blue and overspreading sky, there was a lofty ceiling of graceful metal beams. Gigantic rivets and bolts in the fan vault formed regular constellations. Pillars many miles high connected the ceiling to the floor. At the base of these open silvery smokestacks, though, no soot issued from them. A mere bright floor stretched at their feet. It reflected the distant ceiling. This was a world of silver and steel, without hint of tarnish or rust, without sun or moon or stars. The metallic world was only lit by the infinitely reflected glow of the metal itself. Rebecca muttered, What is this place? Where are we now? This is the same world, Dyfed said, but a different sphere. The first sphere where we stood before lies on the outside. This second sphere is nested in the first. These are what your poets of old called the foundations of the world. Rebecca pointed toward the ceiling. The world we just left is, it is up there? Immense columns, the fan vaults above. They support the weight of a world? Gabbled Rebecca. Yes, Dyfed said. Rebecca slumped, faint, against Yawmoth. He smiled brightly. She's an architect. She knows the load of equations. Knows what it takes to construct a world like this. Rebecca whispered. The foundations of the world. In more ways than one. Not only do these columns uphold the world above, but this sphere of metal is the origin of everything you see above. Rebecca shook her head. How can this place have given birth to that place? There is no food, no water, no sunlight. Nothing could live here. Dyfed pointed outward along the mirror floor. In the dim light, something moved. Many somethings. The creatures themselves were composed of polished metal, and they scuttled in a broad ant swarm. Some had the configuration of ants. Others were centipedal. More still had spidery designs or figures unlike any biological creature. They approached the three invaders with something like hunger. What are they? Prototypes. Experiments. You might consider them highly advanced machines or nascent creatures. They were devised here. This is a laboratory of sorts. No devoid of contamination of biological life. These creatures are mechanisms, yes. But later models, better models, became the serpents in the world above. They were mechanisms? Rebecca asked. They were machines? Living machines, Dyfed corrected. They breathe. They eat. They reproduce. They evolve. They die. Just because their origins are in artifice rather than biology does not mean that they are not alive. Though metallic, their flesh and foliage of the plants they eat can nourish you, Rebecca, and you, in turn, can nourish them. Yama's smile only deepened. 
You found us not only a prime evil empire, you found us a storehouse of inventions. Won't Glaceon be happy, Rebecca? Not if we get eaten, she said nervously as the metal beast converged on them. Diafed reached for her companions. Even as she laid hold of them, the gigantic insects arrived. Antenna sparked with power. Claws swept inward. Mandibles clamped on necks. Necks that had been faded from being. The three tumbled through spaces between worlds and then arrived in a world even stranger than the last two. It was a labyrinth of pipes. Some were miles wide. Others were wide as Rebecca's finger. They coiled and twisted through the dark distances of that sphere. Many glowed with internal heat, as though they conveyed magma. A few oozed tarry liquids. A coil of perfect ceramic pipe gurgled into descending oceans. It was a noisy space, huge and forbidding. It's the same world, but a sphere deeper, Rebecca said. You're catching on, Typha said. Here, all the elements of the other planes are routed and channeled. It is a vast mechanism that replicates the workings of a natural world. Rebecca's panning slowed. She stared in dull realization. If this world is all artifice, who is their creator? She looked up at Dyfed. You? No, she said, shaking her head. Though I thank you for the compliment. No, this place was created by an ancient powerful planeswalker. It was his life's work. Then how can we just give it away? She asked. If this isn't yours, if it's the magnum opus of some ancient planeswalker, how can you simply cede it to the Empire? Shall I show you? Dyfed asked, grasping Rebecca's hand and reaching for Yalmont's. He withdrew his grip. First, show us the rest. You said there were nine spheres here, nested one within the others. Yes, one for each city state and one for Yalmont. Then let's see the rest. They get darker from here on out. The next one is the furnace level, with mile high incinerators not working right now. There are massive refinery stacks and metal mills. Then, there's the fifth sphere, just a sea of oil. There's one down there that is hotter than a sun. Not very welcoming, she said, then snatched up his hand. But the ninth sphere. This time, the ragged blackness between worlds was not as terrifying as the place they stepped into. It was utterly dark and still. The air stank of rotting flesh. Even in the choking murk, Rebecca could sense that this world was very small, only as large as Yalmoth's laboratory in the infirmary. With the soft ooze beneath her feet, she knew that most of the sphere was filled with the corpse of whatever had dwelt there. This is welcoming? Rebecca gasped out, clutching a hand over her mouth. In a way, yes, Dyfed responded. The master of this place died a month ago. It will slowly die after him. Unless, of course, the world welcomes us to take the master's place. She awakened a light above her outstretched hand. The glow splashed across the great carcass. A dragon! Rebecca gasped out. She stood on the creature's decaying hip. Desiccated scales curled like autumn leaves around her feet. Beneath it, putrid meat clung to slump bones. She looked for clear ground on which to stand. But the dead dragon took up the whole sphere. A dragon made this all? From where she stood, atop the leathery wreck of one wing, Dyfed said, Yes, a dragon was his favorite form. It was why the first sphere is filled with serpents, made in his own image. But in truth, his original figure was a human. She waved her hand. There, in the putrid air between them, a ghostly face formed, the vision of a man. He seemed an elderly Glaceon, his fine features wreathed in a white beard and shocks of hair. From here, he can control the whole plane? Yamoth said intently. Yes, Dyfed answered. If we cleared his corpse away, I could control it from here? He persisted. Yes, eight spheres from the city states and the ninth sphere for Yalmoth. If you link this plane to a power stone, you could use it to create a permanent portal from Halcyon? That is the plan, Dyfed affirmed. Yalmoth smiled, eyes swimming with dreams. It will be a world of progress generation. A phyrosis. It will be a world called Phyrexia.